screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our last and final forum of the year, which is Oncology from the Women's Health Innovation Coalition, um, sponsored by Roche and Organon. I am Nicole Palmieri. I'm the Director of Programs here at Springboard, um, and I lead our Women's Health Innovation Coalition as well. Um, at Springboard, and some people may not be familiar, Springboard is an accelerator for women-led businesses in life sciences and digital health. Um, we are a non-for-profit that um, influences investors and innovators and growth within those women-led companies. And also we have our Women's Health Innovation Coalition, which is our forum series that we have here today. This is just an overview of Springboard, um, the measure of, of our success and the results. So we've had about 27 companies go to IPOs, um, 880 companies total um, have gone through our program. 336.4 billion value can created, um, and there's some other metrics as well. 10 unicorns, 89% have raised capital. Um, if any of you guys have any questions about Springboard and our mission, feel free to reach out to myself and I can set up some time with myself and my team. Um, in regards to our Women's Health Innovation Coalition, so this is our framework um, of the program and how the coalition is basically built out um, to our buckets of topics. So as I said earlier, so this is our last forum of the year, which is oncology. Um, our forum before that was cardiovascular. So every year we have a forum series that have different topics within subtopics. Um, as you can see here, autoimmune, there's lupus, multiple sclerosis, and, there, and you can see around the pinwheel, we have some other subtopics as well. Today, we'll be focusing on oncology, which will be ovarian cancer, breast cancer specifically, um, and we have a panel of patients, advocacy groups, um, as well as founders and funders. This just outlines our format of the forum. So again, we have the patient's voice, which is a panel of patient advocacy groups and a few patients here as well, which are part of our springboard um, network. And then as well as our founders and funders panel, which will be hearing directly from patients um, as why innovative solutions are desperately needed in these aspects of women's health. So we have some founders as well as funders and see what their technology and what they've been up to. Um, this just highlights the schedule on the right. Um, of our forum series. So started with autoimmune to our last one, which is today, which is oncology. And then I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Sassman, who is from Genentech. Um, Genentech and Roche are our sponsors for our Women's Health Innovation Coalition. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Nicole, and, and really happy to be here with everybody today. Um, you know, this is the last of the sessions, as you mentioned, um, and it's one that, that's really personal for all of us. Um, and at, at Roche and Genentech, we're really on a mission to transform women's health across diseases um, and, and to leverage our expertise in developing both diagnostics and medicines. But that really doesn't happen uh, unless we're able to partner with stakeholders across the patient journey uh, and, and really particularly innovators um, and advocates um, such as yourselves. Um, my name is Stephanie Sassman. I'm our portfolio lead for women's health. And, um, you know, we know all of us on this call that women account for over 90% of healthcare decisions, and they are really the chief medical officers of their families. Um, and they have also a greater likelihood to engage in digital health tools uh, versus men. But we also know that women, that we all tend to put ourselves last. Um, and so that's why I'm so glad that Springboard Enterprises and the, and the companies um, and advocacy groups and funders that are part of the Women's Health Coalition are, are here so that we can really put women first. Um, and, and really, if we start even at the bench and at Discovery, um, all the way through care delivery, uh, by keeping women at the center of what we do, um, we believe that we can really personalize women's health um, and deliver better women-centered care. Um, and, and that starts by coming from a place of empathy and understanding that the current experience that women has as they interact with the healthcare providers and with other stakeholders um, is not sufficient. And there are gaps across every part of the care journey. Um, and we know that great progress has been made in treating cancer in recent years, but
but there is still so much more that we need to do. Uh, for example, we know that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in women in the US, um, and that that incidence rate of lung cancer has risen 84% in women, but dropped 36% in men just over the last four decades. Um, there really needs to be more examination of what is driving this raise in women um, and, and how we can bring forward more personalized care. Um, you know, just during the time that we're going to be on this call, uh, we know that about two women will die of ovarian cancer, about six women will die of breast cancer, and about 10 will die of lung cancer. Um, and this is also magnified in minorities as well as LGBTQ positive people um, who uh, may not also identify as women. Um, and you know, there, this is far too many. And this is really why we need new screening tools. We need earlier screening tools. We need new diagnostics. We need new medicines and we need new monitoring tools. We need a whole toolkit across the, the whole pathway. Um, and this is why at Roche and Genentech, we're very happy to be supporting Springboard because who better to actually lead the change that we need in women's health than actually women entrepreneurs. Uh, we've, we've waited far too long for these changes to happen. Um, and so empowering women entrepreneurs, making sure that they have funding, um, making sure that they um, have the doors open for them so that they can bring forward new health innovations in oncology um, so that patients can have broad access to these innovations uh, is really uh, something that we support. And we're so happy to be part of the Springboard Network. And thank you again for all of your efforts and looking forward to an awesome session. Thank you, Stephanie. And we just have some other pre-recorded remarks from Alex Davis from Organon that I'm going to play. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective on this important topic at today's Women's Health Innovation Forum. My name is Alex Davis, and I lead biosimilars marketing and strategy at Organon, a global healthcare company focused on women's health. At Organon, our vision is to create a better and healthier every day for every woman, as we believe that women are foundational to a healthier world. Historically, women have faced unique challenges across a variety of health areas, and that continues today. Cancer is no exception. Looking back at our history, until the 1990s, just 30 years ago, women were mostly, if not entirely, excluded from clinical trial research, which led to a major shortage of data on how medicine affected women compared to men. Today, while women are included more, perhaps you can, you can argue, still not enough, racial disparities pervade. A 2019 study in JMA Oncology on racial representation in clinical trials determined that Black and Hispanic representation was disproportionate to their expected cancer incidence. And worse, a third of those studies didn't mention race at all. The American Society for Clinical Oncology warns trials that are less diverse raise questions about the generalizability of results for clinical decision making and contribute to persistent racial disparities in cancer. In breast cancer, the most common cancer in the US as of 2022, Black women were less likely to be treated with surgery, chemotherapy, and hormonal therapy and Hispanic women were also less likely to be treated with hormonal therapy in comparison to white patients. The death rate for Black women due to breast cancer was 40% higher than for white women. On top of this, we can't ignore the cost of treatment. A 2018 study found that most of the cost of cancer care in 2018 for the 15 most prevalent cancer types for privately insured adults under 65 in the US was a whopping $156.2 billion. 
That figure didn't account for anyone over 65 or pediatric cancers, nor did it take anyone with public insurance into consideration. Further, breast cancer required the greatest number of services, including pathology and laboratory tests, in addition to treatment costs. Consequently, it was also the costliest cancer for this population that year totaling 40.6 billion, meaning over a quarter of the total cost for the most prevalent 15 cancers were from breast cancer alone. As we look toward our goal of achieving health equality globally, we're obligated to question the status quo. Women have come a long way, but we aren't truly successful unless all women, regardless of race, financial status, or age, benefit from the important research being done. When it comes to the treatment landscape, thankfully, access and affordability of oncologic treatments is expected to improve with competition from biosimilar options, medicines that are highly similar to FDA-approved brand name biologic medicines that have reached patent expiration, also referred to as reference points. Biosimilars are approved by the FDA after rigorous evaluation following testing to ensure no clinically meaningful differences from a reference point. Biosimilars have the potential to reduce spending pressures on healthcare systems by introducing competition and creating a greater number of people getting access to important medicines. In other words, biosimilars represent more potential treatment options, which can mean lower costs and increase access for patients, potentially closing gaps in her care. More broadly, potential savings to healthcare systems yielded from biosimilars could be reinvested into research and development across some of the most important disease areas that continue to have high unmet need for women. In this future development, we can focus on ensuring representation from diverse populations into clinical trials. We recognize all that is being done to improve her health, from clinical trial inclusion to medicine access. But we also know there's a lot more work to be done. At Organon, we are deeply motivated by our mission to provide a healthier future for all women and for their families and communities around the world. Thank you, to, thank you again to Springboard Enterprises Women's Health Innovation Coalition for giving us all an opportunity to ignite a meaningful conversation. All right. Hello. And I wanna introduce Katie Collins. She is our moderator today. She's the Vice President of G2G Consulting. Katie, take it away. Uh, thanks, Nicole, and welcome everyone uh, to our oncology panel today. We're excited to have you with us this afternoon. Um, I'm particularly excited to be here as uh, cancer policy is uh, has a special place in my heart. I was the policy uh, staffer on then Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot White House Task Force uh, back during the Obama-Biden administration, and then the program director for the Biden Cancer Initiative initiative where we continued some of that cancer work um, outside of the White House um, in, uh, during the Trump administration leading up to his uh, run for president. I've also done congressional advocacy for the National Institutes of Health, um, but, but cancer really is, uh, is something that I care deeply about and so excited to, to lead this conversation today. Um, as, uh, as Nicole said, I'm the VP at G2G Consulting, uh, where along with my colleagues Liz Powell and Amy Sanchez, who are also on the call. Uh, we lead government advocacy efforts around women's health, and that includes um, the eight focus areas that Nicole went over earlier, um, and including oncology. So um, that's a little bit about me. And to tell you a little bit about where we're going today, just to, to let you know what we have in store, we're going to start off with a patient panel, um, where we'll really be talking about patient issues, awareness issues, advocacy issues, and we have a great uh, lineup for you today, um, including Ashley Libby Diaz, Pamela Esposito Amory, and Valerie Palmieri. And then we will get into the Founders and Funders panel, talking a little bit more um, 
about the business side of things, the entrepreneur side of things, and, and why investing in, in innovation is so, so important. Um, and on that panel, we'll be featuring Dr. Stacy Blaine and Miriam Zai. So um, then we'll wrap up with a short discussion about policy, um, both policies happening in Congress and in the executive branch. I'd like to, uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the second iteration of the Cancer Moonshot and what the administration is doing there. So that's just a quick roadmap map uh, for where we're going. And with that, I'd like to dive right into our patient panel. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce Ashley Libby Diaz. She is a breast cancer survivor, an advisor to Springboard, and is currently a life sciences executive leadership and team coach for Grow Mode Coaching and Consulting. She's an expert in medical device technology and a brand and marketing strategist. And she's here to share her story with us today. So Ashley, uh, hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, and thank you for having me here um, and uh, allowing me to share my story. So I imagine that most people on this call or listening in um, are well aware of the stat that one in eight women will receive a breast cancer diagnosis in her lifetime. The stat that we don't talk about quite so much because it's a bit more rare is that of newly diagnosed cases, one in 196 patients will be under the age of 40. I am one of those one in 196. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 36. Uh, my journey to getting diagnosed with breast cancer um, is uh, started a couple of years before. Um, apparently, this is not uncommon, as I learned from my uh, oncologist that uh, my cat actually uh, helped me detect my cancer in its early stages. I was laying in bed one morning, and uh, he walked across my right breast, uh, and I shot out of bed uh, in searing pain. Um, and Nicole, I'm going to be just speaking, so we can either keep the slide up or take it down, whatever everybody prefers. Um, uh, so um, I used to practice physical therapy in my first career, and I knew that the pain that I felt that morning uh, was not normal. So I went to see my primary care physician and she kindly offered me a chest x-ray, which I refused <laughs> knowing it was not my rib that was causing me pain. So for about the next year and a half, I continued to monitor my lower right breast. Um, the pain was there every single time in the same spot. Uh, so about a year and a half goes by and I've turned 36. It's the night before my annual exam and I decide probably a good idea to check that spot once again. And lo and behold, this time I find a lump. So that was in October of um, 2013. My primary care confirmed feeling the lump uh, the next day, which started my workup. I, um, on MAMO, uh, my MAMO was totally normal. I uh, was 36 with dense breasts and fibrocystic breast tissue. Um, and so uh, my, with a normal MAMO, but a lump, I moved on to ultrasound. My ultrasound showed many uh, cysts within my breast, um, but one abnormality. Uh, let's say. That led to, of course, a biopsy. And on biopsy, I was told, this really can't be cancer. It's painful. It's not bleeding. You're so young. Uh, all of these things. Um, that was the day before Thanksgiving in November of 2013. And on December 3rd, on the third anniversary of my first date with my now husband, 
uh, I received a call from my doctor saying, do you have a minute? You have breast cancer. And that started quite a journey over close to nine years now. Um, I was uh, stage one invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, and so thank you to my cat. I discovered this very early, uh, of course, still stage one, still invasive. Uh, and so that led to some tough decisions. My, uh, my BRCA genes were both negative. But I learned quickly, my grandmother was really young when, uh, I, excuse me, I was really young when my grandmother passed away. I thought she passed away of lung cancer. It turns out that she died of metastatic breast cancer in her 50s. And so at that time, I just decided, I don't want to have an MRI every six months. I don't want to live feeling like a ticking time bomb. And so I decided to have a bilateral mastectomy. Uh, that led to four major surgeries in 2014. Uh, I had an amazing breast surgeon, an amazing plastic surgeon. Um, there were some other gynecological considerations as a very uh, strongly ERPR positive breast cancer patient who did not want children. Uh, and so that led to uh, many things, including having my fallopian tubes removed. So there you go. It, it leads to uh, quite a journey. My husband says that uh, I, I should probably not joke that cancer is the gift that keeps on giving, but nine years later, it still feels that way. <laughs> um, and, and I will say, with that being said, there are many, uh, many lessons and gifts that come with uh, such a diagnosis, and there are many difficult, difficult decisions. Um, so uh, nine years later, uh, close to nine years later, um, after my diagnosis, I am thankfully healthy. My husband and I just celebrated my eighth breast cancer awareness month by running our first ultra marathon. Thank you. Um, and uh, it's been a journey to get here. I spent five years to the day on tamoxifen. Um, I have a whole... Uh, arsenal uh, of naturopaths and acupuncturists and oncologists and uh, the list goes on and on uh, that I have on my team today to stay healthy, to, um, to continue to thrive. Um, I, uh, I think the critical thing that I want to share with this audience, there, there are a couple of things. One is, it's just so important to know family history. Uh, Thanksgiving is family history day. And uh, so whether you're making apple pies or watching football or whatever it is, having a celebratory drink, talking about family history. I have one of those families that's uh, sort of a, a cancer family. My father just died of esophageal cancer this summer. My grandfather died of pancreatic cancer. Um, my other grandfather had melanoma twice and prostate cancer. And so although uh, no one has discovered uh, a bad gene, um, I have uh, one of those cancer families and uh, cancers that are known to run in packs. So of course, uh, I continue to be screened for all sorts of things all the time. Um, but it is so important to know family history. Again, on my debt, when I received my diagnosis, I thought my grandmother passed away of lung cancer, not metastatic breast cancer. Um, and now my sisters who uh, are from my dad's second marriage, much younger than me um, in their 20s and, and early 30s, now started getting screened uh, by the age of 25 and have other screening tools available to them um, because they are so young and likely to have dense breast tissue uh, as well. Um, and the other thing is, uh, the two other things, I suppose, I'm grateful to this group and to all those out there who are innovating uh, in the name of cancer prevention, in the name of cancer diagnosis and treatment, uh, survivorship. It's, it's critical. This is uh, a, a lifelong journey. Uh, and uh, as another friend of mine who's sadly no longer with us likes to, liked to say, uh, it's the club we never wanted to be a part of. So greatly appreciate uh, everything that everyone is doing in this community. Um, and 
lastly, I was going to make another uh, important point, which is now coming back to me, uh, which is just to be a really strong self advocate and to know your body, to know your health, to listen to it and to trust it. Uh, what it's trying to tell you. Also your pets as well. They have apparently really great detection methods. Uh, and so uh, listen to your pets uh, when they're telling you something is wrong uh, or potentially wrong, uh, but also to really fight this. Uh, this has been uh, quite a journey of me needing to advocate for myself every step of the way. Um, you know, you, you would be amazed at, at what it takes even as a cancer survivor uh, to, for example, have someone believe that there's a, a lump in your armpit that needs to be removed, um, you know, which which happened to me uh, a couple months after uh, I came off of tamoxifen. Um, so it it is a journey and you need to just constantly, constantly advocate for yourself and uh, and fight for the care that you deserve. Um, and uh, get all of the support you need. So um, I know we have a lot of uh, important messages and speakers and stories to come. So I'm going to stop there. Clearly, I could keep talking and talking, but I'm going to stop there and uh, turn it back to Katie. Um, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, we commend your bravery, your advocacy, uh, the fact that you ran a marathon. That's uh, also very, very cool. And I think it's a great, uh, great reminder. I actually just put a note in my phone that I need to get my genetics uh, run. My grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer at 40. And I think we're learning that just because she was BRCA negative doesn't mean that there aren't some other risk factors. So you just uh, prompted a note in my phone to get off my butt and get it done. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, you, next, Katie. yes, ma'am, uh, we are going to turn to Pamela Esposito Amory. She is the co-founder and CEO of Tell Every Amazing Lady, or TEAL, uh, an ovarian cancer foundation that honors her sister, Louisa McGregor, who died of ovarian cancer in 2011. She is a health, wellness, awareness, education, fundraising. Uh, she's got her hand in everything with her foundation. Um, and I'm excited to talk with you today, Pamela. So over to you. Thank you so much, um, Nicole, whenever you're ready, if you'd like. I do have a couple of slides, but I will be sharing some of my personal story today as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, in 2009, uh, I started Tell Every Amazing Lady with my sister, Louisa. So Louisa was a part of this story and it of course started with her. You can go to the next slide. Um, when we heard that the color uh, teal symbolized ovarian cancer after her ovarian cancer diagnosis, we decided to come up with an acronym that people could remember and was catchy and you know made sense because we needed to do something after her diagnosis. We did not know the signs and symptoms. We did not know um, most of the information about ovarian cancer that I'm about to tell you. And we were really looking for resources. She wanted to find other women who had ovarian cancer that she can talk to. And basically we created something that she was looking for that we couldn't find in the capital of the world where we're born and raised in New York City. How could there not be these kind of resources right here? And um, so this was back in 2009. And unfortunately, she did lose her battle in 2011. Um, but since all of the work that we've been doing really started out as grassroots. I mean, we did uh, meetings in volunteers' backyards. We would, you know, meet within the community. Mm -hmm. And it truly is a grassroots story. We are now um, providing resources to survivors in 37 states. And we, you know, have endless uh, opportunity for people who want to get involved with what we do. And we're able to provide resources to people that otherwise can't find them. Um, one thing that's really special about us, too, is that we are based in Brooklyn, um, but we are the only ovarian cancer uh, community center that is specific to ovarian cancer. And that means that people um, can come in and learn about the disease. We provide resources to survivors and their families and to uh, patients and, and loved ones in uh, whatever needs that they have. Even if we don't have the resources, we can refer them. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so. One of the things that was really, really important were 
the things that Louisa was looking for, we needed to establish something that, you know, other families and other members of the community were looking for because of this disease. So more awareness. Um, she had symptoms, she had signs and went from doctor to doctor. Um, more medical research. There is no screening test. That's one of the most important things, you know, that we learned right away. Wait a second. She's been to all these doctors and no one's really testing her because they don't really have the tools to detect, detect this disease and support. Support was so critical to her. She was being put in other cancer support groups, but she wanted to speak to women with this disease. It was, it's such a unique, special experience um, for anybody's disease, but, you know, she was really having a tough time finding that. And wellness is something that um, we've always had a part of the work that we do, and we've really enhanced our mission to encompass that, especially through the pandemic. We offer all types of uh, art therapy and meditation, beauty aids, and um, things, you know, for mind, body, spirit. It's so important for getting through a cancer diagnosis, not only for the patient, but for the families as well. We also offer a lot of genetic services and education, um, wellness areas, and more. Um, the pandemic has been really hard on us, on our foundation, especially with funding, where many of our um, large-scale events that historically we have with thousands of people at them have actually been canceled. Um, but it was even more critical to the patients who are immune-compromised individuals, and we really became their lifeline, and we still are. There is still a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Access to care is still a problem. I'm sure many of you, maybe even on the call, have known that you know there's months waiting lists to see a doctor now. It's, it's really a problem for someone with cancer and their family. So um, we provide as much lifeline as we possibly can, but you know the pandemic is not over in a lot of ways for the work that we do, for sure. Next slide, please. Um, so ovarian cancer statistics, I, I love that Ashley brought up the one in eight. Um, one in 75 is ovarian cancer. And sometimes people think it's like one in a million. No one talks about this. That's why our name is Tell Every Amazing Lady. Today's a perfect day for us to talk about it. Um, I hope that everyone leaves here with some information. But one of the simple things that we can do is tell someone what you learned today and keep that message moving. That is our message. Tell another lady in your life, a woman, someone who was born in, with ovaries, please share this information. So one in 75, what can you really do with that? You know, learn the signs and symptoms. Understand that if it is caught at a late stage, like any cancer, um, the statistics are not as, as great. Um, but we do know those 30 year survivors. We do have hopeful stories. You know, every individual case is special and different. Um, so in the next slide, we can go to where there are the signs and symptoms. So this slide, a lot of people sometimes get really nervous, become a hypochondriac and maybe freak out. I'm gonna remind you that some of these symptoms, you know, it doesn't mean if you had a plate of nachos and you have an upset stomach, you know, that's not what we're talking about. This is when these symptoms are lasting for more than two weeks. And I'll tell you some of the symptoms that my sister had. She had back pain, but she had an old back injury. So you, she used to say, oh, you know what? It's just that old back injury that's coming back. But it continued on persistently for a while. And she really didn't seek another doctor's uh, opinion on that. So that's one red flag that started about two years prior to her diagnosis. Um, and this was an old injury from childhood. Then she would have weight changes. She was gaining a lot of weight, but she really wasn't changing her diet. She was eating a little bit less. She wasn't able to finish her plate of food that she normally would. So she was feeling full quickly, gaining some weight around her midsection. She had turned 41 by the time she was diagnosed and just thought it was age, right? So there was all these excuses that are made. These are not, you know, just Louise's story. These are very classic ways that people are diagnosed with this disease. The symptoms are very vague. They're very hard to, you know, um, kind of be mindful of unless we're paying attention. So knowledge is really power and seeing those different doctors and making sure that if something is lasting more than two weeks, no matter what it is, we should seek a doctor's opinion on it just as a woman in general. Um, so unexplained weight gain or loss, changes in bowel habits. She was having a little bit of indigestion, um, shortness of breath and changes in anything of postmenopausal bleeding should always be concerning. But any of this again, don't freak out, um, but please make your doctor's appointments and pay attention to your body with these signs and symptoms. So in the next slide, I'll tell you some of the things that we can do about it um, and some things that my family has chosen to do. So when Louisa was diagnosed, um, you know, we actually decided to start a foundation, which most people don't do when their family members uh, diagnosed with cancer. But because it was so important to find resources um, that she was looking for, 
That was one part of it. But the other part of it is her doctors were telling us to get genetic testing done. So she found out that she has Lynch syndrome. And we heard that if we get tested, that can help her diagnosis and her treatment. So I was like, okay, here's my arm, take my blood. I can help her. What, what does this mean? And so I quickly learned that I had Lynch syndrome too. My father has it as well. What does that mean? We're an increased risk for different types of cancers like colon cancer, who my grandfather has, uh, prostate cancer, which my dad later did develop. Caught it early, but he did get it. Um, so sometimes when we talk about breast cancer or ovarian cancer, we really focus on the women's diseases or just breast or ovarian, but pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, maybe they're in someone's family history. It's really important to know that family history, take that information. And um, if you've also gotten tested before the year 2011, it's important to consider talking to a genetic counselor to be retested. And those are some of the resources that we offer as well. Um, panels change. There's new science out there. I've actually been retested and we found out that I have something else called BRIP1. So um, I chose on my personal level to have prophylactic surgery. It took me many years to decide to do that, but I did. And that reduced my risk. Um, it doesn't reduce it completely. I still need to do colonoscopies, but I had a full hysterectomy. Um, I had many reasons that for myself that made sense to me, but um, because there's no accurate screening test and doctors find it really challenging to diagnose this disease, this is something that is an option. It's a dramatic option, but it is there. So it's really important that everyone can know that. Um, I have other, slide, other information on the screen that you can check out on our website of other risk factors and things that you can do. I'll leave you with one good news is if you're on all contraceptive for more than five years, it actually does decrease the risk by 50% um, for ovarian cancer. So there are some things about ovarian cancer um, that you can do to empower yourself with that information. Next slide. Um, thank you. Um, so there are some ways to get involved in our foundation. Uh, you know, the holidays are coming. Like Ashley said, talking to your family about your family history is huge. Um, it is some of the work that we do because it is so challenging to diagnose this. So um, empowering a family with information about their risk is great. Um, you can shop on Amazon Smile for us and look for Tell Every Amazing Lady. You can attend some of our events. Our events are free. There's meditation, right? Who doesn't feel stressed out during the holidays? Um, we have lots of free workshops and, and um, our programs are open to the public so they can learn like today's um, work with awareness and education. But also, of course, if there's any ovarian cancer diagnosis or survivors or families, um, that's where our resources are. Absolutely. And then um, check out our website. There's just different things that uh, might appeal to you. And um, I just am really thankful that I get this opportunity and I feel like uh, things happen to me for a reason. I feel like I'm in a really unique situation where I was the caregiver to my sister as she was dying and leaving two children behind. I was, um, you know, I had a genetic testing uh, situation that was positive where I can call myself a previvor. I took that information and empowered myself and I can help other people to fight this disease, to learn about it and feel the empathy of how it affects a family where we can have better resources that are just not available and out there. So our foundation is important. And so is everyone on this call um, for the work that we're all doing to help women. And I thank you for allowing me to speak and share our story today. So check out telleveryamazinglady.org and thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela. I'm sorry for the loss of your sister. Um, and for what I know your family went through during that process, it's actually the first cancer that I witnessed as a, as a young child of about 10 when my best friend's mom got ovarian cancer. And we would sit in her bed for a couple of years and read and color. And it's just, you know, before she died, it was, it's devastating. And so I appreciate you turning this into something positive and your, your education efforts. Um, it's really incredible. And we're going to keep talking about ovarian cancer from a bit of a different uh, perspective. I'm really excited to introduce Valerie Palmieri. I personally love Valerie. I can't say enough amazing things about her, having worked with her for the past few years. She's the executive chairwoman of Aspira Women's Health um, and is especially amazing because she focuses not only on solutions for ovarian cancer, but reaching patients everywhere in all uh, areas and in all walks of life of all ethnicities. Um, so Valerie, I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce you. Take it away. Thank you, Katie. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just going to give a, a short bio on myself and then just jump into really the feedback. I mean, taking the stage from uh, both Ashley and Pamela, amazing stories. And I, I stand here or sit here as a mom, an aunt, a daughter, 
um, also have a lynch predisposition. Fortunately, I have a variant of an undetermined significance. But the essence of this talk is really taking the feedback from patients and providers and how do we put it in solutions and ensure everyone has equal access. Typically, those that have access to the latest and greatest technology are those that can afford access. And I have spent the last seven years understanding a rare disease such as ovarian cancer, getting an FDA cleared technology available, but more importantly is giving everyone the right to that access because I truly believe not to get political, but the healthcare is, is a right and ensuring everyone gets access. So I'm not only gonna demonstrate to you how we took the technology, but how do we actually solve for giving everyone access and that there is a way um, to make this happen, but it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So I'm just gonna share a couple of slides um, on this journey. And then also more importantly, um, as Ashley and Pamela uh, noted, it's gonna be understanding your normal. And I wanna close with that because no matter if you have the greatest technology, it's really you understanding your normal. So I'm gonna focus on healthcare insurance and this is sharing access to the latest innovation in women's health. And there's two diseases that I'm focused on. One, one is semi rare disease, ovarian cancer, and the second endometriosis. And then how we actually can create proactive solutions and they require input from, from each individual woman. Um, and also, but the key to, to really changing the outcomes are moving the needle for the payers, which they call managed care, but they're really managed cost in my mind, is really improving access. So starting with ovarian cancer, not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want to point out some things. There's only 21,000 cases versus 200,000 with breast, but the survival rate is 49%. So one in two women die. As Katie talked about her first exposure, um, losing a mom, you know, at 10 years old, but one in two women die. So there's very, very few success stories versus breast, which we've had a lot of uh, resources and uh, research, 90% live, um, and prostate, it's 97. So what we have situation with ovarian is 65% late stage, meaning it's already left the primary site of the ovary. There's also huge racial differences, as we just talked about earlier. We're focused on how do we understand those racial differences? Is it just access or is it actually the technology itself? And I'll show that to you. And then there's genetic predisposition, 20 to 30%. And you look at papers with ovarian, it can be anywhere from 10 to 30, but the, but the most recent literature is 20 to 25. So 20 to 25% of ovarian cancer, the women is genetically predisposed. So here in the US, one in 400 women are genetically predisposed, one in 400. In the Ashkenazi Jewish population, it is one in 40, such that in Israel, women actually understand their genetics and they will actually get prophylactically have oophorectomies once they're done having children. And in the Filipino population also, it's very high, it's one in 80. And we'll show some recent data as we just wrapped up a Filipino study. But the root cause of this late stage disease, as Pamela pointed out, is there really is no great technology. Um, there's no screening test. And the solution right now in terms of screening, I hope in my lifetime there is a screening test, but it's very difficult because it's a rare disease. So we have clinical assessment, we have some blood tumor markers, we're actually for recurrence monitoring mostly. And then with tissue analysis, you cannot analyze the tissue just like you would look at a fine needle aspirate for breast cancer or for prostate cancer, they do a fine needle um, core biopsy. So we have a sizable unmet need with ovarian. On the flip side, endometriosis, very large market opportunity, seven to nine years of diagnose. Women traverse the system. Um, they go unnoticed. They just think it's their typical monthly pain. Huge cost to the healthcare system, about $26 billion, $69 billion in e when you tie in economic. It is similar to the cost of a type two diabetic. So we've got two major diseases here in the United States of America, what can we do um, to really move the needle? It's gonna take all of us. I believe I believe with this, I call renaissance of COVID, women who who basically are the the the, uh, the chief medical officer of their family, 70 to 80% of decisions are made with diagnostics, but it's gonna take women and it's gonna take providers, payers, and it's almost flipping the system over. Here at Aspira, um, and we're on this journey as executive chair, I'm arm's length, but I wanna let everyone know it's a journey. And it's really starts with some of these diseases have overlap. Endometriosis has overlap to ovarian cancer. And so we're looking at how technology of puberty all the way through cure, how you can actually look at a woman in their different 
um, age groups, as well as looking at them not only from their demographic age, but also ensuring that we can find the technology, find the disease at an early stage. So this is a blood cancer risk assessment test when a woman presents with a pelvic mass, it is not a screening test. Here right now, CA125, which has been used since the late 70s, only picks about 69% of the cancer. And this, this, this technology will pick up 95%. One in five women have a mass. So when you have a mass, having a blood test prior to surgery is extremely important. In addition, we're seeing that this technology, um, this old technology has differences in race. And we talked about the clinical trials, most of it is who had access to care 40 years ago. It was white women. So we have looked at four larger studies, um, which showed that CA125 is reduced. So then we compared CA125 to this new technology. And you can see here with African-American versus Caucasian women, there's a difference in sensitivity. And what it comes down to is the marker we're using actually picks up the cancer that's more common in white women. And the difference is the current technology we're looking at now is looking at differences in basically nutrition, differences in inflammation, which have no racial barriers. Taking it a step further, there's a Filipino population. And because we're focusing on a rich cohort, we've actually seen this technology pick up early stage disease 92% with 92% sensitivity. Right now today, 15% of women are found early stage. And here, the Filipino population, we were able to pick up 56% in premenopausal and 49% in all women. But at the end of the day here in the States, it comes down to patient access and it comes down to the payers. We're paying for insurance. We want to ensure that insurance gives you access. So personally, I was CEO seven years and executive chair of this last year. We have knocked on every payer door um, and getting in guidelines. So as in next, next slide, you'll see here 67% commercial lives, 73% of Medicaid lives. Most diagnostic companies will not take that time and knock on those Medicaid doors. So right now, about two and 28 million lives. And this also has stemmed through, you know, we had a dip during the during COVID, but what you have here is also guideline committees. So getting the guidelines is important. But at the end of the day, as seeing this journey of getting in guidelines, getting payer traction, really to change the story is giving women access through insurance, but also it's infusing the patient's voice in everything we do. I'm going to share with you four or three testimonials, and these are from patients, as we heard today, but, the, but what we saw here, there's a common theme, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but there's a feeling of not being taken seriously. There's a feeling of going to numerous physicians and your voice not being heard. Um, I wish one of my doctors recognized my signs and symptoms. So actually your symptoms, although they were silent, they were really the trigger. So there's a common theme here of not being heard. So my call to action to all of you is know you're normal. Be heard by your provider. Listen to your body as Pamela pointed out the symptoms. With ovarian cancer, it's called the B. We call it B for bloating, E for eating, feeling, feeling full, A for abdominal pain, T, trouble with bladder, you can't make it through the night. Know that if you have those symptoms more than every other day for two weeks, you need to see your doctor. So you need to be aware that there are solutions and you need to ensure that you gain access to those solutions and that you know you're normal. So that's that's my, my message to all of you. And I just wanna thank you again as patients and caregivers and as a mom and an aunt and a daughter, just understand and use that Thanksgiving table to really talk about your history, talk about any symptoms, I'm, you know, when I talk to friends, they'll say, well, my mom died with something down there. Don't be afraid to talk about your private parts. Amen to that. Just in time, uh, just in time for Thanksgiving, when hopefully we'll all be surrounded by family and can have these important conversations. Um, that was an amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, we're going to switch over to our founders and funders panel um, and, and change the focus just a little bit. And uh, to lead us off is going to be Dr. Stacy Blaine. She is the co-founder and chief scientific officer, as well as the acting CEO of Concarlo Holdings, LLC. She's an expert in cell cycle and cancer biology, uh, currently working on developing diagnostics and therapeutic applications for drug-resistant cancers. Um, she's also the associate professor in cell biology and pediatrics at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, um, and has lab work being funded by both the NIH and the Metaviver Foundation. Um, so very excited to hear hear from you, uh, Dr. Stacy Blaine, over to you. And you are on mute. Yes. And there you have, yep. Yeah. 
And you have to stop sharing so I can put a slide up. Perfect. Okay. Hold on one second. Here we go. Oops. Says I'm not able to share for some reason or another. All right. Well, that's all right. I don't need to share. So, um, hi, everyone. Thanks for um, being here. And it's been amazing to listen to the presentations of the patients. I am a cancer biologist. So I am a cell molecular biologist and uh, work in the laboratory and have for, you know, probably 30 years. And, but I've always kept the patient's journey really uh, front and center in my mind. I did my graduate work at Columbia, um, worked on retroviruses. And at that time, um, HIV was uh, in the early 90s, are really, uh, you know, something that we were all talking about. And I worked in a laboratory that actually uh, was really making seminal discoveries about how the virus worked. We worked on reverse transcriptase as the reverse transcriptase inhibitors were coming around, coming down the pike. And so it really set the stage for the rest of my work, which was um, that what we do in the lab could quickly translate into the clinic. And so it was the work that we were doing in that scenario that helped uh, create the reverse transcriptase inhibitors and the integrase inhibitors, which are still part of the arsenal against that today. And so I took that knowledge with me as I went to Sloan Kettering. Um, they discovered this new protein uh, called P27. I was the first uh, postdoctoral fellow to work on this, and I've continued to work on that for the last 30 years of my career. Um, I moved to SUNY Downstate, uh, which is one of the state universities of New York, set up my own lab, started teaching students. I run the cancer block in the medical school, so I have literally taught thousands of uh, young doctors in New York State. And what I strive to do is teach them the importance of science in that and what science will be in their medical careers, because many of them come in and think, well, I don't need to know this. Um, I'm going to be, uh, you know, an oncologist, and I'm just going to treat patients, or I'm going to be in the ER, and I'm just going to be treating patients. And one of the things that we try to remind them is that uh, everything you treat patients with came from someone like me who worked at a bench, who had an idea and was trying to think of ways to translate basic science into uh, changes in clinical health. And so I, I like to think that I have influenced and brought science to the thousands of these young doctors. But in the early 2000s, my work uh, led to um, this discovery because P27 happens to be the major driver of um, the three, the major inhibitor, excuse me, of the three main drivers of all cancers, ovarian, breast, pancreatic, you name it. All cancers have a commonality, which is that they are essentially a cell that has lost its ability to regulate its own proliferation. So most of our cells in our body are actually not dividing. They are really sort of static, right? Once you're an adult, your liver is the right size, uh, your heart's the right size, uh, your breast goes through rounds of division and then stops dividing once a month during menstruation, yeah, um, and your intestinal cells divide, but it's very, very tightly regulated, right? Because we don't want a liver that's too big. We don't want um, intestinal cells dividing too fast. And so cancer, at its most fundamental is loss of that regulation. And it's a cell that divides all the time. And that division is controlled by three proteins, CDK4, CDK6, and CDK2. And P27 is the natural inhibitor. This is the way our bodies regulate that proliferation naturally, right? So we don't get a liver that's too big, P27 controls these three kinases. So during a normal menstruation, when we are you know, ovulating or our breasts are increasing in size, uh, the, there's proliferation that's controlled by P27. And then when that stops, that's controlled by P27. So P27 is the way the cell normally regulates this process. So I was studying P27. I learned that P27 had this ability to turn these three important kinases on and off. We patented this technology. And then that led to me forming this company called Concarlo. Um, Concarlo actually stands for, it's an amalgamation of the names of my three children, Connor, Carly, and Logan, because what better uh, motivation for me as a scientist than to create a world that has different outcomes for my children. So we started Con Carlo in 2017, and essentially we took it really from an academic idea, this, this patent that we had, this, this piece of paper. And I'm happy to say that five years later, 
Uh, we actually now have um, our first drug that has just finished manufacturing. Uh, we're doing our IND enabling studies and we will be in the clinic in our first in human trial for metastatic uh, drug resistant breast cancer and ovarian cancer in two years, so in 2024. So uh, that's very exciting. Um, and we are now um, actually um, on the road raising uh, what's called a Series A fund to fund the rest of this development work and to fund this clinical trial. And so I have now transitioned from being a person who thinks about proteins in her head and how do these things interact and how are they turned on and off to actually also being an entrepreneur. How do I sell this story to uh, funders, to investors, to the NIH? Uh, how do I raise awareness for this important um, disease, which we've all heard affects young and old? And I would argue that breast cancer in particular is uh, more than just um, a disease. It is something that we as women worry about all the time. So it's something that we live with. We all know someone who has it. We worry, will we get it? Uh, did, when did I make my mammogram? Am I due for it? It's something that lives in our life. And so it's something that we need to talk about. And that's something that I have taken on in my classroom and, and as well in some of my advocacy, which is let's um, unmask it. Let's talk about it. Let's make it almost as common as the common cold, because in reality, that's what it is for women. And ovarian is um, the same. And I'm happy to hear about these organizations that are increasing the advocacy. So I now um, sit in this cross roads between I do science and I also uh, run my company. We've expanded from you know, a really small company to now we're 20 plus people. We're bi-coastal. We have people that work in Canada. Um, and we talk all the time about how our therapy is transformative in this space. We're the only company going after P27. And people ask me all the time, well, if it's such an important uh, a protein and it regulates you know, these three main drivers, why is everyone not drugging it? And the bottom line is that, you know, that a lot of people are sort of, they drug what they know, and uh, this is a little bit hard to drug. And so people have steered away from it. And so we are taking on a big challenge. So it's also important for us to really educate the funders, educate pharma, um, explain to them why this is a transformative target and what we can do. And we do that mostly by showing the data that we can actually extend the overall survival of our drug resistant metastatic mice uh, fivefold. And those are the things that we want to do in the human scenario. And so while there's been tremendous progress in the breast cancer space over the last uh, you know, 40 years since the introduction of Herceptin or Tratuzumab now almost 40 years ago, which really transformed the HER2 positive space. And then the CDK4 inhibitors came on into the space in the early 2000 uh, teens, so 2015-16. This is Ibrams, Virginio, Kisquali. These are drugs for patients with metastatic breast cancer. We know that we still have a lot of work to do. Because even in the face of all of this, uh, you know, 43,000 women will be diagnosed this year in the metastatic setting. That is where cancer is moved from the breast to other parts in the body, very difficult to treat, and still unfortunately a terminable disease. Even though we're spending billions of dollars um, on research, we need to continue spending billions more. And we need to be thinking about it from um, the perspective of novel targets, novel therapies, novel approaches. And so one of the things that I would encourage everyone in this panel to do is um, in addition to urging your network to get checked, um, I would extend that. I would say, you know, keep pressure on your Congress people. We need to continue funding, strong funding to the NIH. That's the major funder of biomedical research in this company, in this country. Continue funding organizations like the MetaViver Foundation, which is one of the only foundations that strictly focuses on funding metastatic breast cancer research. And I would also say, you know, support biotechs, support innovative biotechs uh, that are out there you know, trying to translate what's in their head, what's in the laboratory, what's in their students' hands and their postdoctoral uh, uh, fellows' hands into actual clinical entities. We don't let that research get stuck in academia and the ivory tower. We need to move it out. We need to move it to our patients. So um, that's sort of my story. Um, I'm actually in San Francisco right now at a uh, fundraising event. So I'm talking to lots of funders. I'm talking to lots of big pharma, telling them about P27, telling them, showing our data, and really trying to uh, convince them that we have an innovative, transformative way to deal with both metastatic breast as well 
well as ovarian cancer. So very inspired by everything I've heard today um, and know that those of us that, that live in the laboratory, uh, we do keep the patient's journey first and foremost. I work with some of the most amazing um, academic clinicians, I'd say in the country, uh, who run clinical trials at Sloan Kettering, Columbia, Dana-Farber. They've been with me on this journey um, since our inception, since we started Con Carlo, and they keep us very patient-centric. Uh, they keep us focused on how will we dose the patients? How frequently will the patients be in the clinic? And those are things that we think about because quality of life for our patients is important as well. But we really want to transform this drug resistance space. And um, I'm happy to be uh, here representing science and representing the scientific perspective um, in this journey. So thank you. Thank you. And I did, I think we fixed the screen sharing. Is there anything you'd like to show? Um, any, any graphics? I just want to give you that opportunity. Sorry about that. Um, no, I think I'm good unless anyone has a particular uh, question. I think hopefully um, you understood this. I mean, maybe one oh, graphic. Yeah. Let me just show one quick graphic yeah, uh, just to just sort of show where P27 is, except for it's still not letting me share. So it says you're share. Oh, it said you were sharing. Did you see it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Go back. Okay. It looks like it's in the process of trying to share. Okay, well, let's see if it comes Let me up. give it just a sec. There we go. Yep. Okay. I can see. Great. Okay, so I just wanted to show this slide, which is a little bit ugly. And this is not actually breast cancer. Um, this is a really famous work from someone else. This is, I've been talking a lot about drug resistance and I know that we've been talking about catching cancer early and I'm the biggest advocate that treating cancer before it's actually really bad cancer or before it's metastatic cancer is always the way to go. And, but what does drug resistance mean? And I think it's important just to, to share that. And so we live in an era of what's called precision oncology. And the point of precision oncology would be if I could identify the particular mutation that drives your particular cancer, then I could give you a specific drug for that cancer. And that's really what, uh, for example, trituzumab, her Herceptin was. It is a drug that is given to women that have HER2 positive breast cancer. And it was really transformative. The problem is that many, many patients become resistant to these drugs. And that was really confounded us for a long time as a field. And what this is what resistance looked like. So this is a man who had a melanoma that was driven by a particular mutation called BRAF. And we give him a, gave him a drug called Zelbaraf. And you can see every single one of his tumors disappeared within 15 weeks. But you can see every one of his tumors came back within 15 weeks because his tumors evolved, they continued to proliferate and they changed and they escaped that blockade that we put on. So I just wanted to show this one slide, which is essentially that this is what I call the oncogenic funnel, which is that all of the signals that drive that cell, that cancer cell to proliferate, they sort of start at the top of the cell, they go to the middle of the cell, and they go down to the bottom of the cell. And that we as a field are really good at drugging the top of the cell and the middle of the cell, but you can see that we're less good at drugging the bottom of the cell. And if I think about this as a funnel, the same way that if I try to block the flow of water in a funnel, it's much harder to block the flow of water by blocking the top of the funnel or the middle funnel, it's really easy to pinch off the bottom of the funnel. And so we need to, as a field, focus on targeting the bottom of the funnel. And that's what we do at Concarlo. This protein that I've been talking about, P27, we drug this protein, P27, which, as I said, controls these three main drivers, CDK4, 6, and CDK2. And so I'm going to end with that. And that was just a little science. Um, and hopefully you'll remember the name P27, CDK4, CDK2, because those are really, um, in our opinion, how we're going to transform the drug resistance in um, not only breast and ovarian, but in numerous cancers. So I will pause there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm definitely going to remember pinching the funnel instead of trying to block the top of the funnel. I love that analogy. And that makes a lot of sense, especially uh, if you're like me and all you have is a, a little bit of a pre-med education in your science arsenal. Um, thank you so, so much. Okay. And of last, but certainly not least, um, I'd like to introduce Miriam Zai. She is the founder and CEO of iSono Health, uh, where she focuses on early detection of breast cancer using ultrasound and remote monitoring solutions. So Miriam, uh, we're excited to have you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, giving the opportunity for me to speak here with uh, the was It's been so inspiring to hear everyone's stories and uh, um, our story. My co-founder, Shad, is actually here as well. Uh, our story started also with a personal story. Uh, both of us, uh, we, we come from engineering background. Both of us, while we're finishing our PhDs across the country, uh, uh, you know, we had close friends of ours uh, uh, lost to breast cancer that was detected too late, unfortunately. And uh, adding to uh, what Dr. Ben is working and uh, developing amazing uh, therapeutics, uh, uh, our vision was how can we uh, make sure more women have access to earlier detection and making sure they have, uh, they can, uh, their cancers can be caught at a point uh, that's more treatable so that they're not part of those 40,000 women that are lost to uh, uh, breast cancer. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So our vision uh, was to develop this platform for any detection and monitoring of uh, cancer, starting with breast cancer, because of course that's a problem that's uh, very personal to us. And we have developed this uh, um, wearable, portable and automated ultrasound. This is the scanner and attaches to a wearable bra. You can see here that attaches to, this is the level of portability of the system and uh, it's, to create a really a new paradigm in breast health monitoring and early detection of breast cancer so that every woman has access and uh, uh, chooses to uh, do regular breast cancer screening. A lot of us, as you know, um, are not doing our regular screening. And that, that results into, even in US where we have uh, existing breast cancer screening programs, only half a woman over 40, 50, 40% uh, 40 of women over 50 do their regular screening. And as a result of that, uh, I, a lot of my cancers, one in three cancers are missed at early stages. What is the most treatable is the most cost effective and um, uh, offer the best quality of life. If you go globally, of course, there's a billion women who don't have access to breast cancer screening. And uh, our solution aims to solve both of these problems, both within US and globally. and uh, what are the solutions? Uh, many of us have done mammograms and we know uh, what a poor experience it is. As a result, about a third of women after the first mammogram never go back for a second. This is one of the reasons many cancers are missed. The other reason is that uh, which has happened to our friends, and uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot, there's been a lot of advocacy recently, is that mammogram doesn't really work well in dense breast tissue. And uh, when we started this, we thought maybe it was a small problem, but when we looked at, into it, our minds was blown. And when we said, could there gotta be something uh, to do uh, done with this? Because 50 to 70% of women, depending on your background or ethnicity, uh, um, uh, have dense breast. And also uh, the uh, screening programs, as was mentioned by somebody else, were not designed uh, for women of diverse background. Often it's shown that African-American women are getting diagnosed at earlier uh, ages. So there, what are the alternatives? Um, MRI is really not scalable, even though there is a lot of um, advancement is happening there. Ultrasound as a technology, well, having both of us work on ultrasound, uh, we realize it's scalable, but we realize that both manual and automated systems are lacking um, uh, the true scalability that either requires an expert present or a really large system. And we developed our solution, which is uh, a portable and automated ultrasound that can be uh, deployed essentially anywhere by anyone. Uh, really two minutes, you can capture the whole breast and we have really advanced image processing that allow us to visualize the breasts uh, uh, in uh, 3D. We have advanced uh, AI algorithms and I wanna talk about that a little bit more because uh, there was so much mention about breast cancer risk and genetics and our system while having these algorithms also allows for repeatable imaging. So as women, not only we can uh, uh, 
detect uh, if there's any abnormality, but monitor changes and couple that with breast cancer risk and genetics to have a truly personalized health management platform. And we have collected clinical data. We've shown our efficacy uh, uh, across uh, over uh, about 150 patients shown that is comparable to standard imaging. And uh, where we are right now is we're moving to the commercial uh, phase of the um, uh, of, uh, of our uh, uh, company and as we have gotten our fee clearance and uh, along our patient care pathways, we all have seen from uh, self-monitoring to screening to uh, um, even screening for dense breasts and eventually surgical planning and monitoring. We really think that our system can be a tool that can be deployed all across the patient care pathway. Of course, we're doing this in phases and we're quite excited um, uh, we're starting at the uh, right of the uh, um, uh, right of the patient care pathway at the most acute, and then moving more towards uh, uh, screening first line, and then eventually uh, we uh, we truly believe that this is something that can even be done at home or in a walk-in type clinic by women. So making sure it was mentioned uh, that breast cancer is something that is uh, on women's minds all the time. When we started before we started the company. We talk to a lot of women, high-risk women, uh, families of breast cancer uh, patients, breast cancer survivors, and uh, they said all the same thing. This is something that it's on our mind uh, all the time. So we truly believe by having a system that can be deployed in along the patient care pathway, we can really give women a peace of mind and making sure that more women have access to uh, regular breast cancer screening, well, whether it is in their you know, local Walgreens or CVS or the uh, OBGYN's office, uh, because our system is so easy to use that it can be used even in point of care settings. And, and uh, because we've talked about this, there's been a lot of advocacy, there's laws passed around dense breast tissue. Now, FDA has issued guidances um, and there's reimbursement, of course, but there's a lot more that can be done on the advocacy front as well. And, and, uh, and it's really great that we're having this panel and talking about this, that, uh, you know, um, the, the more women have access, the more women know that they have dense breast, that they need additional uh, screening and uh, uh, it, it will become uh, more and more effective. So uh, we hope to be part of the solution that brings access to um, uh, breast ultrasound first for every woman who has dense breasts and eventually for every woman at the uh, in a more convenient and accessible and easy to use uh, uh, locations. Um, I have a lot of slides that I'm not going to go over, uh, but I wanted to say that um, yeah, we are currently raising a round of financing to bring our product to market, uh, starting, as I mentioned, with uh, uh, companion dyes, a companion diagnostics for, uh, uh, for oncology and surgery, and then uh, follow that by... Um, following that by going to a distributed cancer setting and being part of integrated cancer care where uh, we can have more patients identified at early stages so that the therapeutics that are uh, being developed are more effective. Uh, and uh, uh, we, st we strongly believe that we have a competitive advantage by offering a system that is uh, both compact and automated at the same time, uh, improving access and offering uh, advanced imaging and uh, 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 for physicians and convenience and access for women. And uh, we have done all of these with our amazing team and uh, advisors. And uh, we are lucky to have been working with Ashley uh, um, on marketing, uh, who's here. And as I mentioned, our next phase is uh, bringing our product to market and commercializing this. And hope uh, that you can join us along this journey and, uh, um, and uh, really excited to be here. And thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Miriam. What a great way to uh, to conclude our panel today. I know we had a couple of slides left. I'm going to defer to Nicole whether we're just going to whether you want to power through quickly or just wrap it up. It would either is fine with me. Yes. No, I just kind of didn't go through everything for the sake of time. If any yeah, questions, you know, I can always yeah. go through a more detailed go to market plan or uh, you know reimbursement and pricing strategy. Uh, but 
Our biggest vision is creating a system that is so flexible that can be deployed anywhere and by bring and making it as a service platform and integrating different uh, type of features in there. Uh, we truly want to make sure that every woman can easily access this uh, um, uh, either uh, you know in their home or close to them uh, eventually, and uh, you know, and making sure physicians have the tools to do a better diagnosis and better monitoring. Whether it's a surgeon, I know some oncology panel surgeons and oncologists having access to 3D views of the breast. Um, like this, uh, you know, uh, that is not available right now uh, in the surgical suite or whether it is for monitoring response to therapy with our amazing 3D data. Um, so we really want to make sure that uh, we make uh, um, breast cancer detection and monitoring uh, more accessible, more personalized. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We're going to wrap up with just um, a few quick uh, slides and pointers, uh, information on what's happening in the policy space uh, in oncology. I'm going to be really quick because I know we're over time and I'm sure everyone's missing their next uh, meeting. But as you can see here, we have a lot of congressional activity in the oncology space, um, especially actually on some of women's uh, specific cancer like breast um, and like ovarian, which is really great. Um, I've, I've put two up here that deal with breast cancer. Uh, one that we've worked very closely uh, with Valerie on about ovarian cancer access to multi-marker uh, testing for ovarian cancer. Um, in, and Medicaid coverage so that we're addressing that access issue. Um, and then this last one here, this Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act has had a lot of attention in Congress, um, putting, putting priority on screenings uh, that can test for multiple cancers, you know, across types. So this is exciting. Um, both because hopefully we'll be making uh, legislative advances here, but also because we have congressional members thinking about these issues, being educated on these issues. And I think we've got a greater understanding and focus on why innovation um, and, and ensuring access to innovation is so important. Um, and on to the next and last slide. I would be remiss if we didn't talk just a little bit about uh, the second version of the Cancer Moonshot, which um, right now two of my teammates uh, are, are continuing, previous teammates at, uh, at the White House. So the, the Cancer Cabinet, which is kind of the reimagined federal task force, met in July of this past year um, and talked about what their exposures are. You can see them here screening, um, especially for those that might not have access to screening or those places where screening tools don't exist. Um, environmental exposures, particularly for our veterans and our service members, um, preventing cancer. So uh, we're getting there before, before it starts, but also what can we do um, in health and, and wellness and lifestyle to prevent the cancers. Um, research, again, access to those, those cures, as, as Stacy mentioned, that come from uh, bench and, and translational research, and then support for patients and caregivers. That has been Dr. Biden's uh, real focus area since the beginning, um, is recognizing that burden and providing tools on the non-science side to help patients and their families. Um, so those are some priorities, and I just wanted to call out a couple of initiatives here at the bottom that are currently un, uh, underway. Uh, NCI has started a multi-cancer detection. This kind of goes along um, with the bill that we talked about on the previous page. So this is a huge um, liquid biopsy study that's really exciting. Um, there's a new NCI grant program for early grant opportunities uh, called the Cancer Moonshot Scholars for new PIs. So if you're working uh, with any young PIs in this space, this is a great one to know about. Um, looking at how we use telehealth for cancer and how we can promote oncology best practices through telehealth. And then um, an interesting project called Prometheus run out of DOD's Mirtha Cancer Center that's uh, addressing this exposed service member piece through some of the previous um, data and biospecimen initiatives that were started under the previous moonshot. And so I realize that's a lot. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. 
Um, if you have any questions about policy, Congress, White House, or just anything that, that we're doing with WIC and Springboard, I uh, would love to connect with you and, and want to thank you for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to, to close us out, but it's been a pleasure to be your moderator. So thank you. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for being here, being a part of the panel and those who attended today. Um, just a, some upcoming events we have for Springboard. We have our pitch event for Women's Founders on December 6th and a Lunch and Learn event on December 14th. Um, if you guys are interested in any of these events, you can actually scan the QR code on your screen um, and get some information to RSVP to attend, um, as well as if you have any other questions regarding Springboard or our Women's Health Innovation Coalition, feel free to reach out to myself. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good day. Bye. Thank Hi, everybody. You. Thanks awesome for your time and your stories. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, Bye, everyone. everyone.